My wife Sherry is from the Pacific Northwest, and on the three and a half days a year when it's not raining out there, <laughs> the Pacific Northwest is the most beautiful place on Earth. You have the Cascade and the Olympic mountain ranges, you've got the Puget Sound, you've got evergreen forests, and the crown jewel of them all is Mount Rainier. Here's a picture of it. Mount Rainier, you can't escape it. Wherever you go in the Seattle, uh, Tacoma area, you can just see Mount Rainier at 14,000 feet. It is the tallest mountain in the Cascade Range. It's 26 glaciers are the source of five rivers and its snow-capped beauty. It just dominates the horizon. We like to call it just the mountain. Like, hey, look out, look, the mountain's out today. So let's say you and I are in Seattle looking at the mountain, and I say this, the mountain is going to vanish. And you go, yeah, yeah, I know, it's a volcano and it's gonna erupt sometime. And I say, no, 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 I, I don't mean that. I mean that mountain, Mount Rainier, that mountain is going to vanish. One week, it'll be there, and the next, it won't. Now at that point, you have one of two options. I'm guessing you're gonna take option number one. You're gonna to turn to me and say, Kendall, what have you been smoking? <laughs> it's no, there's no way that mountain is gonna disappear, right? Now your second option is to believe me, in which case you will quickly ask, seriously? When is that gonna happen? How is it gonna happen? Give me the details. And by the way, let's hightail it back to that sandbar we call Florida because I don't wanna be around when a mountain vanishes. We're in a series called Follow. We're looking at what it means to follow Jesus by looking at his life in the book of Mark. And today we're in Mark chapter 13. Jesus is in Jerusalem with his disciples. In chapter 11, we saw him do his last miracle. In chapter 12, we saw him have the last confrontation with the Jewish religious leaders who are now seeking to kill him. And by the end of this week, by the end of the week, they succeed. Jesus is crucified and dead by the end of the week in Mark 13. Now, Jesus knows all this. He has tried to tell his disciples that it's going to happen, but they are just unable to wrap their heads around it. Chapter 13 is a private warning from Jesus to his disciples that things are about to go sideways, not only for him, but also for them. If you have a Bible like I do, where, where the, the words of Jesus are in red letters, you'll notice that pretty much all of chapter 13 is in red. These are some of Jesus' final words to his disciples, and they have a kind of, a kind of urgency to them and in an intensity that we haven't seen as much up to this point. So we're just going to dive in. Mark chapter 13, verse 1, it says, As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the wall. The disciples here are having a Mount Rainier kind of moment. Look at the mountain. Look at these stones. And let me tell you, the Jewish temple was the kind of building where you could have that kind of moment, right? Built by, the, by Herod the Great, the, the Jewish temple was a, his architectural masterpiece. It was, it was an engineering marvel. And that is saying something because Herod was a lousy person, but he was a great builder. <laughs> and he built a lot of beautiful buildings. From the moment you laid eyes on it, the temple arrested your attention. One of the historians of the day, a guy named Josephus, this is what he wrote about the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. He said, the exterior of the building wanted nothing that could astound either mind or eye. For being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from the solar rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like snow-clad mountain, for all that was not overlaid with gold was of the purest white." What a sight that must have been. And as if you were a traveler coming toward Jerusalem, the closer you got, it just increased in grandeur. Here's an artist's rendering of, of the temple as, as you might have seen it as you were approaching 
Jerusalem. You can see how the gold on the roof might glitter in the sun and how the white stones might shine. And after traveling for a, a, a long time through a hot and dusty place, we were like, oh my goodness, this looks beautiful. The stones out of which the temple was built were expertly crafted, expertly dressed. They fit together so tightly and so precisely that in some places you couldn't even get a piece of paper in between them. They likely weighed several tons each on the building. And the stones at the base of the temple, the stones that kind of hold up what's called the Temple Mount, those things are massive. Sherry and I had a chance to go to Israel some years ago, and here's a picture of Sherry with some of those stones. Look at them. These things are three to four feet tall. They're eight feet wide. They're up to 40 feet long. The big ones, the 40 foot ones, they weigh 160,000 pounds. How in the world did Herod do that? All right, so, so, so the disciples, you can see why they're a bit starry-eyed here, right? They look at this and go, oh my goodness, what a building. This temple is, is, is a wonder. It's, it's, it's a work of art. And on top of that, it's the center of worship. It's holy. It's supposed to be the place on which God's presence rests. Look at this building, Jesus. Can you believe it? So how does Jesus respond? Verse 2, Jesus replied, yes, yes, look at these great buildings. Dramatic pause. But they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. And then he walks off. <laughs> and I imagine the disciples are just standing there stunned in open mouth disbelief. It's like, wait, what? What did he say that... That's not possible. Look at these stones. They're huge. And this is the temple, for goodness sake. It's the center of the universe. It's where God dwells. How is that even possible? But by this time, Jesus is down the road and going up the other side of the hill. Now, it's possible, of course, because the temple is about to become obsolete. With Jesus' death and resurrection, which, as I mentioned earlier, is only a few days away, there will no longer be a need for sacrifices because his life is the ultimate sacrifice. With his death and resurrection, there's no longer a need for the temple because through Jesus, God actually lives, dwells within us. When we are in Christ, the Apostle Paul says that our bodies become his temple. So, so Jesus was about to make the whole temple system obsolete. And that's not even to mention the fact that the Jewish leaders had long since ceased representing God and his interest. It's, ve it's been very clear throughout the whole story, hasn't it? That the religious leaders, most of them, that they represent only themselves and their own interests. So the disciples scurry down the hill and, and run up toward Jesus. And then they say, wait, 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 wait. Can we talk more about this? Verse 3 says, later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. So Jesus is looking at the temple. Here's that picture, that painting again. And it probably had a view similar to this because this painting was actually drawn. The easel was on the Mount of Olives when the artist drew it. Okay, so Jesus, across the valley, looking at the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? Okay, the boys are more than a little bit disturbed. Jesus has just kind of rocked their world. If the temple is going to be destroyed, oh my goodness, that means the end, capital E, the end is, is coming. And they want to know exactly what to look for so they can be prepared and probably so they can escape and get out of there. And Jesus' response to that question, what will the signs be, takes up the, the whole rest of chapter 13. Now, we're not going to read all of it, but let me take you to a few places so we can talk about what it means. So the disciples ask Jesus, what's the sign we should be looking for? When will the temple be destroyed? And this is what, this is his answer. Verse 5, Jesus replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. 
Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines, but this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I mean, isn't that what we're living in now? Afghanistan, Lebanon, Haiti. Take a dart and throw it on a world map and there's probably something going nasty in that spot of the world. Here's the thing. We think that things right now are worse than they've ever been, but that is simply not true. Things have always been bad. There have always been wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famine. I was stumbled across an article this week by a guy named Stephen Davey. This is what he writes. In the last 5,000 years, there have been at least 14,000 wars. In the past 150 years, the Western world has entered into 400 peace treaties, each one averaging a two-year lifespan. One author put it best when he said peace was only a period of time when everyone stopped to reload. Humorous though it may be, the world seems to use the interludes between wars to gear up for the next round of conflict. So Jesus, what's the sign of the end? Well, there'll be wars, there'll be threats of wars, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be famines. But that is just the beginning. That's actually not the sign. Well, okay, Jesus, thanks for all those encouraging words. Well, wait, it gets worse. Verse 9, he continues, when these things begin to happen, watch out. You will be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. For the good news must first be preached to all nations. But when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. And children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, so we get to add a few more things to this. We got wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. And, and, and now Jesus says, okay, you can add beatings, arrest, trial, betrayal, hatred, and death. Right? It sounds like one of those disclaimers at the end of those pharmaceutical ads, you know, can cause beatings, arrest, trial, hatred, and in severe cases, death. Consult your physician before trying world peace. <laughs> Have you noticed thus far, by the way, that Jesus haven't given the sign? The disciples said, what is the sign? How will we know when these things are going to take place? They asked very specifically, when will this happen? What should we be looking for? And so far, Jesus has talked about mayhem and discouragement and oppression, but he hasn't given them a sign. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. Then, if anyone tells you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. Watch out. I have warned you about this ahead of time. At that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. All right, so we have our list, wars, rumors, rose, et cetera. Now we can add false messiahs, false prophets, deception, anguish, sun and moon go dark, the stars fall out of the sky, and then, and then Jesus returns. And when he does, he comes with power and he comes with glory and he gathers his people from every part of the world. That is awesome. But Jesus... What's the sign? How will we know when these things are going to happen? You're still talking 
in generalities. We've always had war and disaster and deception and false prophets, and, and we have all those things now. I'm pretty sure the sun and the moon are still shining and there's no stars that have been falling. So I guess that we're somewhere between anguish and Jesus return. But, but Jesus, when will this happen? You're not answering my question. Keep reading. Verse 32. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself. Only the father knows and since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard. Stay alert. Jesus' answer? No one knows. <laughs> Jesus is not answering my question because no one knows when this time will come. No one knows the day and the hour of his return, the day when all things will be made right. You will not know, Jesus says, until it's on top of you. There'll be no warning. So then you'll know when you know. <laughs> you'll find out when you find out. And in the meantime, by the way, he says, it's not your job to know. Stop fixating on stuff that's beyond your control. Stop trying to fit God into your timeline kind of box. Stop asking him to bless the plans that you've already made. And instead, what do we do? Well, here's where it gets kind of interesting, I think. I don't know if you've noticed, but there is a theme in Jesus' very unhelpful, opaque answer to their question. Let me just take you through the passages that we read verse 5, Jesus says, don't be misled. Verse 7, he says, don't panic. Verse 9, he says, watch out. Verse 11, he says, don't worry. Verse 13, he says, endure. Verse 21, he says, don't believe lies. Verse 22, he says, don't be deceived. Verse 23, he says, watch out. Verse 33, be on guard and stay alert. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying this, as you follow me your whole life, as you follow me, you will face trouble after trouble after trouble. It will be messy and chaotic and painful. And in those times, you will be tempted to put your trust in something or someone other than me. Don't do it. Don't panic. Don't be misled. Don't let your worry deceive you. Watch out. Watch out. Be on guard and alert because if you're not alert, your inclination will be to swallow and follow a lie. So Jesus says, hang on tight and keep watching for me because I am coming. Now, how do I know this is what Jesus means? Well, because he tells us. <laughs> Keep reading verse 34. He tells a story. He says, the coming of the Son of Man, that's the, the title that he used for himself, the coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his servants instructions about the work they were to do, and he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. Very importantly, he doesn't tell the gatekeeper when the return will be. He gives them work to do. He says, this is what I want you to be doing until I come back. Keep reading. You too, Jesus says to his disciples, you too must keep watch for you don't know when the master of the household will return in the evening at midnight before dawn or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone, watch for him. That is, live your life in light of eternity. Live your life in light of the reality that Jesus is king and he will return. And while you wait, give yourself fully to the work that he has for you, the work of building his kingdom, the work of carrying out his mission. Don't sit on the couch longing for his return. Don't get distracted 
by shiny things or massive stones that will ultimately disappear. Don't even get distracted by theological discussions regarding the exact whens and wheres and hows. <laughs> Be about his kingdom. Follow his instructions, watching always with hope for his return and at the same time working always with diligence at his mission, the mission he's given us to be his voice and his hands and his feet. Bottom line, there is no sign. There's no sign. There is only trusting Jesus today in this moment and joining him in his work around me. And sometimes that work is happy and joyful and satisfying, and other times it is exhausting and discouraging and painful, but all the time it is the path to life. So watch out, stay alert, press in, don't give up. In A.D. 70, about 40 years after Jesus made this prediction, there was a Jewish revolt and the Romans descended on Jerusalem and they demolished the temple. They didn't leave any stones standing of the temple building. But by this time, the Jesus movement had spread throughout the known world and for them, although it grieved them, the temple had long since faded away because the work of spreading the good news of Jesus, what, was it, what it was all about, and it continued unstoppable. It changed the world. A couple of months ago, we were in Seattle on a ferry boat in Puget Sound. We were going from Bremerton to Seattle, and it was one of those three and a half days of no rain. <laughs> and the mountain was out. As a matter of fact, all the mountains were out. It was just gorgeous as we stood on that ferry. The only thing that we noticed was what looked the western horizon was very threatening. It was, it was dark and angry, this bank of clouds. It looked like, oh my goodness, it's coming toward us. And, and I mean, it was, it's, it was like, okay, there is a storm in those clouds. But as we stood on that ferry and watched that dark, angry bank of clouds, a hole appeared in the clouds. And then suddenly the sun blazed through that hole. And by the way, this picture is, is unretouched, okay? I didn't put it through a sunset filter or anything. This is what we saw. You can, you can only imagine what it was like in real life, okay? Because the clouds, they just lit up like they were on fire. And it was far more than a beautiful sunset. It was breathtaking. I thought maybe that Jesus was coming back right then and there. <laughs> and honestly, I think this picture is, is a pretty good picture of what Jesus is saying here. As you follow me, it will get dark and angry and threatening. And there will be times when you can't see me. There'll be times when it seems like I've gone away. But don't let that distract you from the reality that I am here in all my brilliance and glory and beauty and majesty Pursue me with all your heart and join me in this mission to this dark world because I am breaking through all the time. And stay alert because one day I will step out from behind the clouds and I will gather you home. How do you need to respond to the truths we've just talked about? What are you fixated on instead of Jesus? What are you worried about instead of focusing on Him? Would your life be characterized as watching, staying alert, and doing what He's called you to do, or, or, or is it more like you're sleeping? And if you're sleeping, what would it be like to wake up intentionally wake up and say, Jesus, my life is yours. And I'm waiting with hope for your return. And in the meantime, I'm going to take as many people with me as I can.
Let's pray. Jesus, your glory and your brilliance and your beauty and your majesty one day will knock us off our feet and we will kneel before you and worship and joy and delight and all the pain and suffering and sorrow will be washed away. And we long for that day, but we know it's not here yet. And so in the meantime, I pray that we won't get tripped up on other things, that we will keep our eyes fixed on you, fixed on your presence and your life, and that we will do the work that you've called us to do, that you'll show each one of us what it looks like to be part of your mission as we are your servants and you're gone on that long trip. Show us how to step in and be your voice and your hands and your feet. And then Jesus, we can't wait for that day when you appear in all your glory and you gather us together and all things will be made right. But until then, help us to know you, to see you, to follow you, and to bring others with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.